also uh, don't speak very much Spanish. And in fact, my Spanish uh, has gotten worse since my children got older and I stopped watching Dora the Explorer. <laughs> so, lo siento, I'm sorry for uh, not being able to speak more. But, um, so, uh, I'm Jeff McMullen. Uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, hashtag for my session is uh, SITX for Citizen Experience. And uh, why I'm here today, I'm, I'm here today because at home in Canada, it's really cold. <laughs> and so I thought I would come here and uh, enjoy the sun. Uh, and we had a special day for just today for rain because I had to be inside today. So thank you for arranging that. Um, but uh, no, I, I, uh, I got on an airplane and I came here uh, this week. It's a long ways. Uh, but uh, I really came here to tell you stories. And uh, so the first story I'm going to tell you is a story about losing something and a story about finding something. So I've been working in user experience and design since 1996. And in 2003, I started my own company. We got to work for big corporate clients, Fortune 500, Silicon Valley startups, got invited to pitch against very large firms, and sometimes we even won mostly because we were cheaper. But I burnt out. I didn't want to do it anymore. I was really tired. I needed to do something different. So in 2009, I left my company I, uh, with one of my partners, and I wanted to answer a question. The question was this. What happens when we think about the citizen experience the same way that we would think about customer experience? What happens if we use the same kind of design tools and thinking and innovation techniques to improve how things work in government? Where would that take us? Because government needs it. <laughs> government today uh, has all kinds of challenges. Um, and that is true the whole world over. It's a challenge here. It's a challenge in Canada. It's a challenge in the UK. Um, it's a, a global challenge for all of us. And unfortunately, Good government is getting harder because the world is getting more complicated. We have globalization and climate change. We have economic uncertainty and shifting demographics. All of those kinds of things make for a very uncertain future. And so we need to be able to do government differently than we do today. So how do we do that? Well, one piece of the puzzle is to look to industry and seeing what has made the biggest difference in industry. If we look at industry in the private sector, there's been a shift over the last 15 years or so where some companies like Target and Apple have focused on the customer experience. So they've transformed their company by focusing on design and customer experience. People love Apple so much they wear their logo, their free advertising, just to walk around. Now, if we think about customer experience, when we think about citizen experience, I want, to think you, I want you to think about your own citizen experience. Just right now, how is your citizen experience? And where is your I love the government t-shirt? <laughs> so, um, this here is uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, in one of the United States uh, states where you have to go to get your driver's license. Um, but uh, people don't love it. But we can improve the citizen experience. We can do better. And in fact, sometimes it's even easier than because there's so much to, to do that we can make it good improvements, like Lisa was talking about. There's a lot of core things that we can make a difference in. And we can do that through looking at design and how can design help us with the citizen experience. Now, you think. We're in a design conference. Everybody knows what design is. But when I talk about design, I might be talking about something differently than you think about. I think about design as a, as a continuum uh, and uh, different kinds of things. So we can think about design as style. So how do we fix the government? Obviously, we need a new logo, right? Because that's design. A lot of times when you talk to senior executives in government or in your own corporation, if you work in the private sector, that's what they think you do. They're like, oh, you'll give us a new logo. Maybe they think about how something works. This is a ballot for an election. Does anybody recognize it? 
Why is it famous? Because it failed. And the, so this ballot is the ballot for the 2000 presidential election in the United States. And to vote for Al Gore, you had to punch one of these holes. Which hole should you punch? This one is for George Bush. So this one is for Al Gore, right? Right there. <laughs> it's not. And in fact, enough people in three counties in Florida punched that second hole instead of the third hole that was really voting for Al Gore that George Bush went to the White House and started the Iraq War and hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives because of that piece of paper. So the kinds of things that we're doing in government matter. We need to solve problems. We can get people to medical care, either in an ambulance or in a helicopter. We can think about how we can solve the problems that we have. But we can think about problems differently. We can f define the problem through framing. We're going to redefine. So instead of a Department of Motor Vehicles in Alberta, where I live, we actually have private businesses that can renew your driver's license called a registry. There's one right here. And it's about one kilometer from my house. And there are hundreds of them. And so there aren't any lines like that anymore. Sometimes small lines, but no big lines because we reframed what it meant to get your driver's license. Now, how can we apply design in an organization? There are six particular things that I think are talents that designers have. There may be uh, kind of the power that design has. Now, you probably already do these things, but government doesn't do these things. So. They're not just ways of doing something, they're ways of thinking. And design thinking is a term that we use sometimes, but really design thinking is just an attitude, a way of thinking um, that comes from being a designer, from ongoing design practice. New ways of thinking can create a new culture, like Lisa was talking about changing how the government thinks. So here are six ways to change a culture. The first one, the power of design for the power of possibility. Designers ask, what if? What could be? What could happen? They explore and push the boundaries. They don't just look at what happened in the past or what the party line is. They say, what's possible? And that's exciting. As well as saying, what's possible? They say, what's real? What actually happens? not just around a boardroom table in a meeting, but out in the real world. So the power of real world observation, of going out into the world and seeing what happens. What do people do? And once you go out into the world and you think about what's possible, you start to see systems. You start to see the complexity of the world on all the relationships between big things and small things, what things, uh, how things happen, and why they happen. And as you see systems, as you start to understand how complex something is, you need to be able to handle that. So many people start to see the complexity of the system and they run away. But designers move forward and they move forward by making things. They make prototypes and visualizations, concepts, so that they can understand the systems that they're working in. You can make it concrete and tangible so that you can understand what kind of possibility that you have. And because you're working with these kinds of tools where it's just a prototype, it's not something that was big and expensive to make, then you can make lots of them. The power of iteration. So you can learn and improve and change to go forward. And then the power of co-design. All of this works better when you do it with other people, when you invite other people to design with you. Last, bonus superpower. When you do those things, you make stuff that is meaningful for people. It actually makes a difference in their lives. So how do designers actually make a difference in government, though? So you've got these powers. You've got your superhero's uniform. Right? All of you, C 
secret identity as designers. But uh, so you can get involved in uh, open government, in hackathons, in volunteering in your community. You could actually apply and work for a central design team like Lisa does. There's a number of them um, in Latin America. Or you could work for a government department. Or you could consult with government. So you can actually start to build relationships with people who are involved in government. But as you do that, your fundamental job, no matter what you're doing, is to translate citizen needs into government capabilities. You need to say, what do people need? How can government actually do that? So the needs of citizens become the driver for what government should be focusing on. So there's three kinds of things you need to keep in mind when you're building new government capabilities. So the first one is designing for service. And we're actually going to hear from Andy just after the break a lot more about this. The second one is design for policy. Lisa already mentioned this, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that. And the third is design for change. So design for service. You have to be able to move from actually understanding and prototyping to actually doing something. Services are the primary way, the main way, that people have interaction with government. You might vote in an election once in a while, but you actually notice if the, uh, the roads don't work, or transit stops, or other things that are government services, or if healthcare isn't working, for those of us from countries where government uh, is enlightened enough to manage that. But uh, that, uh, apologies for our friends from the United States, but you're getting there. Um, that, uh, so public services use the capabilities of government to create value for citizens. And to design for service, we need to do three things. We need to understand people, and not just people in a broad sense. We need to understand people individually. What are the individual needs that people have? Because that's what you can design for. You can't design for a, a cloud of people. You need to design for a person. Now, Code for America is a nonprofit in the United States that uh, sends teams of volunteers, Code for America fellows, to partner and work with different cities in the United States. And the fellows work with the city over the course of a year to build a new app or a new service for the city. So in 2012, um, a team went to New Orleans. Here they are. And I've got to hang out with Alex and Eddie and, uh, a few times to hear their story. So they went to New Orleans. It wasn't that long after Hurricane Katrina. Many homes were destroyed. And it was dangerous. And it actually damaged the neighborhood, too, to have these kind of properties there. Um, and so people wanted to get rid of that blight from their neighborhoods. So they would go and identify it. And eventually, the city would come and destroy the home, and the lot could be sold for somebody else to use. So City Hall knew what it wanted when the team arrived. That uh, They said, we want to make it more efficient. We want to have an application for reporting these uh, broken houses. We're going to make sure that you can send them, and it will be very quick to get them to us. The team went out into the community and actually did research, though. They talked to people in the neighborhoods. And they saw that what communities were doing, they mapped that. Uh, and then they would send in a report, and they had no idea what happened. Nobody would tell them. And it, the only thing they could do was to call a phone number, and that person had to make a bunch of phone calls and call them back in three weeks. So the team said, we need to fix that. And so their user research unlocked insights so that they could create value and design a valuable service for people. So they went and looked at what needed to happen inside the city to make that happen. They brainstormed how things should work. And then they created an application called Blight Status that actually shows you the process from reporting to actually 
or resolving a case. And so now you can go online and check any address in New Orleans. And they've actually created a, a startup to do this for other, other cities at civicinsight.com. So understanding users, let them do new things. We have to, when we're designing for services, we also have to coordinate channels and touch points. We have to make sure that things work together. So here's this morning's schedule, right? But the organizers had to actually make sure that Andy showed up. And we had to, to actually make the web channel and the face-to-face -face channel work together. So when we're designing for services, we can't design just for digital. We have to think about how does that fit with everything else that is happening in someone's life. And especially when we're designing for services, we need to manage handoffs and transitions. When somebody's switching from the web to a counter or to the phone or between web and mobile, they can fall off. They can, and we need to be there to catch them. We need to be able to make sure that when somebody changes how they're accessing a service, that it still works for them and that we don't forget about them. So, BC Services Card was a project where we looked at how um, a new kind of government ID, we actually got to make an ID card for, for BC. Um, but to do that, we did field research, we looked at, at how people um, uh, use ID and identity, and then we looked for patterns, we created different ideas of what we could do in co-design workshops where we looked at new service concepts, and then we prototyped those and actually documented them and shared them with the public. And we did a broad consultation so that people could understand how digital services would work together and could make recommendations on how it should work. And now hundreds of thousands of citizens have this new ID card that will let us do new kinds of service innovation in government. So designing for service, we need to understand people, coordinate channels, and manage those handoffs and transitions. Second, designing for policy. If we're going to work with government, we have to understand policy. So policy, who even knows what policy is, right? As I, before I started working with government, I didn't think very much about policy. Isn't that when you have to fill out a form in three different versions? Um, so designers should care about policy though because policy is the decision DNA of government. Policy defines how governments decide. So if you want to change how a line works or a new kind of application, there is going to have to be a policy that changes to support that. And if you, the policy doesn't change, then it doesn't matter how brilliant your design is. It won't happen. So you have to understand how to work with policy. And actually to, to think about, well, what do people do? And then what do, we need, what do we need to do at a policy level to help them? Because in most organizations and in many governments, policy is confused. Sometimes one ministry will say, we are going to decide this way. Another ministry will say, we're going to decide this way. And when you actually start to bring uh, user insight into policy decisions, then they start to, to align. They actually start to line up and support each other and have connections because the policymakers understand what happens in somebody's experience. And then you can actually connect that policy to doing those services. So any time that you're going to reframe a problem, you're going to think about something differently and, and redefine it, that almost always means changing policy in government. So like for taxes, in the United States and in Canada, I'm not sure about here, you have to fill out a very complicated form every year, and you have to send it in, and if you're wrong, then you can get charged money, <laughs> um, they, a penalty. So in California, they will actually fill out the form for you, because they actually have the information from your employer and from charities and other things, and they know the numbers. They, other people had to submit those numbers to say, oh, this is what, what we paid. 
Um, and so they fill out the form, and you just look at it and say, OK, and press a button. Um, and this happens in Chile, too. But to change that means changing a whole bunch of things about government. But we have to be able to improve not just services, but also policy. When we're doing policy, that we need to build common ground. We can help people make the right decisions faster by using design. Now, when you make a decision, there's something going on in your head. You actually have a little world inside your head. That's you in your brain. Um, and what you do is you look at the future and you tell yourself a story with what you think is the, the world and say, does it make sense? The problem is everybody tells themselves different stories. They all have different maps inside their head. So a lot of decisions are just arguing about who has the best map. But if you can create a common map, then you can make a better decision. And the way that design does that is to actually create uh, something called boundary objects. A boundary object is anything that lets people look out in the world and have a conversation from a different point of view so that they can have a conversation together. And in design, we make lots of boundary objects. We make prototypes. We have research findings. We make some of those other diagrams like Lisa was talking about so that people can have a shared conversation and make a faster decision. Third point for designing for policy, we have to respect scale. This is something that's hard for designers. Policy operates at a different scale than products and services. So this is from our workshop yesterday, and we were changing how the airport would work. Um, and it was really fast. Right? We were able to, to go through and look at a bunch of different options really quickly. But to actually implement those kinds of changes in government can take a long time. And if you think you're going to be able to change policy every week, then you'll be sadly disappointed. And that's true of every government. It's true everywhere. Um, and part of the reason is because government has to serve everyone. Even these folks who were banging drums and protesting in uh, the main city square yesterday. Um, but they still have government services. Um, that, uh, it, and so it can be hard for policy to move quickly. In BC, we worked on a policy project for domestic violence. So you can, and uh, my client there was Dominic Bond, who's the executive director for court reform of how courts can work better in BC. She used to be the director of the service design team in BC, and then she moved over. Um, so that's why we were able to do that project, is because we had a designer who was the boss. Um, and so we went out and did field research. We understood what does it take to get a restraining order. So if, some, if, your, uh, if your spouse is going to be violent to you, you can get a paper from the court to tell them to stop. And, uh, and so we went out and we understood what happened. We created a, an, uh, an understanding of the whole system because lots of people had ideas what to fix, but everybody just looked at one little part. They just looked at their own part. And then we were able to create uh, policy recommendations uh, together and to say, if we make this kind of change, it will help the process here and to be able to say how that would improve things. But it's going to take at least three years to implement the big policy changes there, because they actually ask a whole bunch of people to work quite differently. So designing for policy. We need to have our decision DNA to be able to look for common ground and to respect scale. Third thing, design for change. It's not enough to design for services. It's not even enough to design for policy. You actually have to be able to design for changing the organization. Now, Christina taught a workshop this week about designing for change. But it's something that we all need to do. And it's true whether you work in government or in a startup or in a big organization. 
but especially in a big organization like government. Because governments resist change because it's scary. It's terrifying to change. Um, and in fact, we evolved to not like change. Right? So if, you, uh, if your ancestors, who lived a long time ago, before we had houses, but things were going good, they hadn't been eaten that day, then they should do the same thing as they did yesterday, right? If you change something, maybe you'll get eaten. <laughs> so we have a deep inner fear of change as human beings. So we have to think about how can we help people change. One thing that we're thinking about um, in the work that I do in British Columbia is something we call the service architecture framework. It's a way for us to think about change in government. I've been working on it with my friend Alex McLennan, who's the executive director for strategic design in BC. And Alex and, uh, and I have been working on this model. It's five layers. All models are better with cake. Um, <laughs> that, uh, and these are the, this is what we are thinking about for how we need to think about a project and what needs to happen on it. We don't need to do all of these things, but we need to think about all these things and what needs to change so that we can be successful. So we have to think about the client interface. So how does somebody access a service? But we also need to think about what does and what happens behind the scenes? What are the operations of the organization? And then we need to think about policy and strategy, like we were just talking about. But we also need to think about how the organization is structured, what the teams are like, who's hired and what their jobs are, what their incentives are, and what their values are. And then we need to think about legislation and regulation and government direction. So we need to look at all of those things. We don't have to do all of them, but any one of them can cause our project to fail. And every one of them, we need to find the right person to talk to to make sure our project's successful and to help them early so that they're not surprised later when we say, oh, we'd like to do this new thing. And then the policy person says, no, you can't because we didn't talk to them and they're surprised, and they don't like change. So we've started asking ourselves at the beginning of projects, where are the risks and where are the opportunities to the project across all of those levels? And who do we need to work with to look at all of those parts? And that's how we start to think about our extended team. So we might have a core team that's going to do field research and design and prototyping, but we want to have an extended team that includes policy people, that includes operations people, that includes human resources people who help understand hiring and job roles and things like that. So this is actually part of Columbia's service architecture here. Um, Columbia has a central design and innovation team in the Ministry of Technology. And um, they've been mapping the different layers that the, the Columbia government uses to deliver services. And, uh, yeah. and so they, they're doing some, some really cool things there. Unfortunately, I don't have a better story to tell you than that, except that it's awesome. And uh, so designing for change, we actually have to think about building capability one of the things that people are afraid of is that they won't have a job anymore when we come and talk to them because we're cool designers and they're not. <laughs> really, they're scared. They're saying, oh, there's these new skills. But the truth is there's so much work to do in government that there's no way that even all the people in this room could do it. Even if all of you quit your regular private sector job today and all went and worked in government, there's too much. And so we need to be able to, to actually build the capability inside of government. And there's something that I think of as the Hogwarts moment. Do you guys know Harry Potter? Okay. So 
if you're going to ever read Harry Potter, you should plug your ears, because I'm going to spoil the first part. <laughs> Harry Potter is a young boy who lives with his aunt and uncle, and he has very unusual things happen throughout his childhood, and he always feels very alone and not loved. And then, on his birthday, his 11th birthday or 12th birthday? 11th birthday, thank you. He starts to get letters, hundreds and hundreds of letters just flying in. And eventually, his uncle runs, runs away, takes him to an island, and all of a sudden, somebody finds him. And he says, what's going on? And this new friend says, Harry, you're a wizard. And he opens the letter, and it's an invitation to wizard school, to Hogwarts. And so he goes and has all these magical adventures. There is a moment for public servants that you can be Hagrid, and you can say that you are already a designer. Many public servants already use design thinking and design tools without knowing it. They have ways of solving problems that are very similar, and we can nurture that. We can help it grow. So um, in BC, we've given out a lot of books. We've built some online resources. We're building more online resources. We've done training and events, and people are involved in their local user experience communities, like IXDA. And most of all, we bring public servants, regular public servants, into projects and turn them into designers during the project. We teach them design skills, and they're part of our team. Last thought on designing for change. We have to change culture. And the biggest reason we have to change culture is so that we can give the organization confidence in the face of uncertainty. We already talked about that there are uncertain times ahead, especially for government. And design can help you have a set of tools to face the unknown. But it only works if everybody is on board, if it's something in the culture. Just like Lisa was talking about, it can't be your team's job. It has to be everybody's job. And I'm going to tell you a few stories of people doing interesting things to change their culture. And then I think we'll be done. So this is Don Iveson. He's now the mayor in Edmonton, where I live. But he was a city councilor before that. And this is a campaign video that he did to explain complicated urban planning ideas. So, he wanted to have a serious conversation about the future of the city, but he knew that people didn't care about policy, just like you didn't care about policy. And like, why would I go and talk to somebody about urban planning policy? So he made this Lego video to talk about the future of the city and had a great conversation. Unknown to him, the city's urban planning department also liked Lego. They'd seen him talk about urban planning and Lego, and they planned an a public exercise. They built a neighborhood that represented Edmonton, the city, and invited people to come over two days, Lego was a sponsor, and build anything that they wanted to add to the city. And then those entries were judged by Councillor Iveson and two other city councillors, and the best ones ended up in, on display at our science museum. And now that model is at City Hall and parts of it go out to teach children about how the city works and how it's growing. In BC, before we got to do some of those bigger projects that I already mentioned, we, uh, the team there, before I worked with them, started to do something called Dragon's Den. Now, on the BBC and on the Canadian Broadcasting uh, Corporation, there's a show called Dragon's Den. In the United States, it's called Shark Tank. And so you have an idea, and you come and you present your idea, and investors decide right then whether or not to give you money to help with your business. So teams of public servants would come with a problem, a real problem that had been hard for them for a, a while, and they would work for a week 
with the citizen engagement and user experience teams, and they would think about who they served and what they needed to do, what that person's journey was, and then they would come up with ideas and present them to a panel of senior government executives who would give them money right then or not to try out the idea. Not very much money, just enough to try it out. And then they could see if it worked or not. And so that actually changed how people started to think about designing for, for citizens. Now, the team has gotten so busy lately, they don't do it anymore, <laughs> which is a little too bad, but uh, it's interesting. But in BC, it's not only those kind of um, grassroots things where just public servants would, would do those things on their own, but the most senior executives have created a strategy, an approach that says we need to put citizens at the center. And there's three pillars to that, to save citizens, to, to use open data, to save citizens in their time, in their interactions with government, and to encourage collaboration inside of government. And then the digital services consultation that I mentioned. Those things have created a culture within government, and there's still a long, long ways to go, but there's support for doing good user experience work inside of government there. Of course, it's not just in Canada or UK or United States that cool things happen. My favorite example of municipal service delivery for a city is in Guadalajara, actually in Zapopan, one of the five boroughs that make up Guadalajara. And this is Rodrigo Herrera. He's the CIO and head of government innovation in Zapopan. And it used to be there were just four offices for two million people. And if you wanted to do something with government, it meant you had to take a day off of work. Rodrigo and his team built these kiosks, and super kiosks even. And you can phone, you can access any Mexican government website, this kiosk will let you pay taxes and get permits, and this prints the permit or your receipt. And so now, 90% of the population is within three kilometers of one of the kiosks. And the huge lines that used to be at the offices are much smaller. It's actually the best municipal service delivery that I've seen um, anywhere, actually. So designing for change. So thinking about what our service delivery architecture is, building capability so we have friends and helpers and people who understand and support and work with us, and then working on the culture, helping to do things that people can rally around. So how do designers make a difference in government? Designing for service, designing for policy, and designing for change. I have two last stories. The first one is the story of citizen experience itself. If you think about citizen experience, it's a focus. It tells you where you should put your energy, where you should pay attention. And it's a bridge. It connects people who have different ideas and gives them something in common to create value for people. And it's a compass. It can show us the direction to go. It can help us face that uncertain future and help guide us there. And you can help. Get involved in your community. You don't have to work full time for government to help have an impact. You can understand what's happening and let people know whether they work for government or whether they're elected officials, that there are opportunities for them and that you have some time and could help them. And in your everyday conversation, talk about the citizen experience and how valuable that is. When you're designing things to work better for people, remember that we should help design government so that it works better for people. And that changes the conversation. When you talk about the citizen experience, people have different conversations. They value different things, and they have different priorities. So you can put design to work. You can help government make the right decisions faster, 
find confidence to face uncertainty, to reinvent government, and to rediscover a culture of opportunity. I think many of us are jaded about government. I've become so optimistic in seeing the kind of stories that Lisa's telling, some of the other places that I've shared with you today. And all around the world, there is tremendous opportunity to do better. There are great, great opportunities. So I need your help for this very last story. You help? See? I need you to get out your mobile phone. Okay? Everybody have your phone? Find it? I know you have one. <laughs> they check at the door. You have your conference badge? Do you have your phone? They don't let you in without it. Um, that might not be entirely true. I, because I don't have, I'm from Canada, I, I don't, it's very expensive to call. So I haven't used my phone very much this week. But get out your phone and turn on the flashlight. Whatever the flashlight is, if you have this, or a white screen, and put it up. And then you're going to count with me. I'll just do it in Spanish, because I remember that much. Uno. With me. Uno. Dos. Tres. Look around. Look around. In ancient times, people used to navigate by the stars. They used to find their way by looking to the heavens. But people are going to find their way by looking to you. You can make a difference. You can help change the citizen experience in your community, in your country. And to be able to transform how people work. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing what you do.